Hello, uh, welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is uh, Jason McPhee, and here with me to discuss current issues from a libertarian perspective, I have James Just, uh, Vice Chair of the Sacramento uh, County uh, Libertarian Party, and Devon Minima, uh, Dixon uh, City Council member. So jumping right into things, I guess uh, last Tuesday was Constitution Day, and so there's going to be an event uh, this coming Sunday. Devon, did you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, every year we do a Constitution Day dinner. This is our third year doing it. Um, for the last two years, we were lucky. Constitution Day fell on a weekend. But so this year we're doing it on Sunday. It's uh, September 22nd uh, at the Dixon Veterans Hall. Uh, it's uh, 1305 North 1st Street at 6 p.m. And uh, all are welcome. It's going to be a fantastic event. We're, uh, the Constitution turns 232 years old uh, this year. So... It's, uh, it's uh, great that the legacy is still alive, the ideas are still alive. We hope that we can re-implement them back into our government, um, but it'll be a fantastic event and it's a tri-tip dinner, so come hungry. Ah, well, you can't lose that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, jumping on to a, uh, uh, one of the uh, current legal issues facing Californians, uh, a Assembly Bill 5, AB 5, recently passed, and that actually uh, interferes with people's abilities to be able to uh, contract with uh, businesses as an independent contractor. And so this kind of hits that gig economy issue, um, uh, people being able to be Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. That's, I think, what the main uh, aim of this was, uh, to try and uh, curtail uh, or, and regulate a little bit of those relationships. and. Uh, and so, uh, Devon, uh, did you want to did you want to enlighten us a little bit about AB five and what it's going to mean for California? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, AB five is actually going to be codifying. Uh, there was a, a state supreme court case called Dynamex versus California um, that uh, essentially said that uh, subcontractors it created this new uh, test for whether or not a subcontractor should be considered an employee. And the the problem with that was that, of course, it was way too broad. It was practically impossible. To not fit, or to fit the criteria for being an independent contractor, unless you were, say, a construction guy or, or you know, uh, an electrician, something like that, doing specific jobs uh, on consumer homes. And so, uh, what a lot of people are concerned about with this AB five is that it's going to hit not just the gig economy, which was what it was targeted at, but it's also going to be affecting truck drivers. Uh, across the state. People who are putting food on the table tonight because they're able to be an owner-operator uh, in the truck driving industry and, and really throughout, uh, throughout all of the industries that you can possibly think of. There are independent contractors everywhere making it work, making it happen. And uh, this has been a huge threat um, because we're talking about um, essentially making it possible for subcontractors, not only are they going to be entitled to more benefits, um, which is, uh, you know, I get that's, that's not a bad thing, but at the same time, uh, you're limiting someone's freedom of association. They drew up a contract or the company drew up a contract and that person was willing to accept that responsibility and was agreed to get paid X amount for that. Um, so it, it really is violating someone's freedom of association in order to say, you, you can't do that anymore, you have to go on payroll. And I think a large part of this is it's a cash grab because when you have that, you're not getting the income tax up front. You're not getting the FICA tax up front. You're getting it later in the year when they pay, pay their self-employment taxes. So I, I'm very concerned about this. There are people in my district that I represent that are only able to put food on the table because they're independent contractors and they get to live the dream of, of their their dream of being their own boss to some extent. Well, one of the things that uh, it makes me wonder about this too is this was an assembly bill, so it's not something that was voted on by the people. This was something that was voted on by the representatives. And, and so it really makes you wonder, is this something that is popular? Is this something that people are supporting? Uh, may, maybe in your district you'd understand whether or not there's people want this or do they actually, are they upset or are they concerned that this has passed? Well, unfortunately, I think the number one thing that people are, are showing is confusion. Okay. They, they don't understand how this law works. They're, they're assuming that um, 
that it's going to disrupt things, but they don't know how. You know, um, I, I'm a gig worker. I, I have a day job, but occasionally I drive for Postmates. You know, and I love getting to deliver food for people, and uh, and you know, <laughs> being their delivery guy. Um, but with this new law, even I'm concerned as to okay, well, how is this going to be implemented? This was a a sledgehammer reaction to a, a a problem that is arguable if it even exists. So, just from a legislator's standpoint. I would be horrified by this kind of law coming out through my city council, let alone from the state assembly, where these are professional legislators who, you know, have staff and should be informing them on, you know, the least impactful way uh, to solve a problem. Well, one of the things too, I guess it, it so it requires you to have an employee-employer relationship instead of, uh, you know, to be more of an independent contractor. Which with Uber drivers and such, one of the things I've had with conversations I've had with Uber drivers that I've uh, taken uh, have have let me know that the best thing about the job is that they can do it whenever they feel like doing it and they don't have to you know if they don't feel like working that day they don't have to yeah. well as a as a gig worker I am a gig worker this thing is is has the potential to completely disrupt my way of life I because I don't just do one type of gig work and according to the the, the, the rules you have to only do that type of work so like I deliver half my time I deliver Amazon packages and another part of my time I spend picking up scooters taking them home charging them and then dropping them off again out in the morning so other people can arrive as electric scooters is that the same job or is it two different things in my one service am I doing two different services now what if I have a part-time office manager job am I shuffling paperwork now can I not so the whole thing is so confusing and for the most part, there was no push for this inside the community. If you go into the, the Uber and Lyft groups, if you go into the Amazon groups, no one's asking for this. No one wants this. The only time when people come in and they post, and, hey, look, there's this event, everybody rails them and chases them out the group. There's no push for this except for people yeah. outside of the, of the gig economy. It's people outside of the gig economy who want this. There's a handful of people who want to be employees who, for whatever reason, are in the gig economy. They shouldn't be in the gig economy. They should go out and get a job. There's plenty of Amazon delivery drivers jobs. You can get them at the drop of a hat driving the white vans. Those of us who drive our own cars, we do that for a reason. I want to be able to wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning, look at things, say, okay, I'll work today. Or no, I won't. You know, I'm going to do something else today. I've got a doctor's appointment, so I don't have to work. And I don't have to call up my boss and say, I've got a doctor's appointment. I need to skip in. I'm not feeling good today. I'm not calling. No, I just don't work. I just choose not to work. Or just the other day, I went to a trip to Oregon and back. I didn't have to call in and ask for anybody. I didn't have to ask anybody for permission. I just drove to Oregon and back. You know, and they're forgetting that there's a there's freedom. That kind of freedom has a value, but the, our legislatures don't value freedom. Yeah, sounds a little bit like a libertarian's dream: the gig economy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we get to, I get to pick and choose when I work, who I work for, and. You know what days I work. If I want to work 13 days in a row, I can work 13 days in a row, and then I can take a week off, and I don't have to ask anybody. I don't, <laughs> you know, it's, I can just do what I essentially what I want, and I'm not being oppressed. I'm not being taken advantage of. You know, well, it just begs the question too: Is this a, a, a nanny state move, or is this a little bit more nefarious, where it's the competitors of the gig economy trying to get together and, and nuke the gig economy? Well, <laughs> there is there is a part to that. I was, was thinking about this the other day. If you look at the people who support it, it's a bunch of unions. Mm. Yeah. And so, so how do you get around labor labor laws? You sign a union contract. So in theory, Uber could sign a union contract with a union, and then those union workers can sign up the union workers as essentially independent contractors but as employees it's all very weird i think it's a back-end deal by unions to try and get uber and lyft to sign them a, a a labor contract well and that's exactly what it is because you have to look at the irony of this this is the the freedom that being a a, a gig economy worker provides is exactly what nancy pelosi was talking about when she was talking about people being free to be a writer free to be a comedian, free to do artsy stuff, and, and choose what they want to do with their lives. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's the freedom that the gig economy provides, is you can design your own schedule. You can design and decide your own economy. How much do I need this month? How much do I need to work this month? Okay, maybe I don't go in today, or I, I don't have to. I don't have to alert the boss that, you know, I've, I've got to be slou you know, <laughs> slouching through the, through the office for the rest of the day. 
Per yeah. Perhaps there's another uh, element to this too, though, but it, it, uh, this type of economy makes us all a little bit more responsible to each other because we are, we're all trying to figure out, I guess, uh, how best to serve our fellow man, and and you know maybe that's driving a car one day, maybe it's picking up scooters the other day. You know, like yeah, it's, in and recharging. I have to, eat, and I it's my responsibility to to find out what the market is going to do on any particular day. Like on weekends, I know Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays are big scooter days. So if I don't want to work Amazon that day, I don't have to because I can make a hundred bucks a night charging scooters. Now on Mondays, I know Mondays and Tuesdays are slow scooter days, and so I, if I want money those days, I'm going to have to go work for Amazon or go do some f food deliveries. You know, I'm signed up for all kinds of different things, so I can go do food deliveries or do Amazon or drive for Uber and Lyft. Now I personally don't drive for Uber and Lyft because I don't like the the way their payment algorithm is. They kind of change it, it's kind of secretive. And so I don't drive for them very much. That was my solution to that. I went and I started doing for Amazon or, or other people. Now, I, I also know that Uber and Lyft, you have a higher potential. I, you can make more money driving for Uber and Lyft than you can driving for Amazon or doing scooters. But you cost you more money and you have to deal with the drunk people. And you know, you have to work a whole, whole lot and you have to work hard. I don't particularly want to do that. There's other people who like to do that. There's other people who enjoy driving drunks around. And hey, knock them, you know, knock yourself out. You do that and you get rewarded for it. At the very we, least, good entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some guy the other day made 600 bucks in, in a weekend night in, in wow. eight hours. Just yeah. driving drunk people around Sacramento. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and there it's solving a problem. You know, we talk about not wanting drivers on the road who are drunk. And now here's a whole army of people who are willing to go out there and move those people around in a safe way. So, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the things things that struck me too about a comment you made was that you know you were you know a lot of people when they talk about the economy and they talk about the businesses it's sort of like well it's a little guy I have no power but you know you were just saying that I saw that this company was doing something I didn't really care for so I just went to work for the other one and it was pretty easy being part of the gig economy you just fluidly make a choice to work for one company yeah. rather than another company you can delete so, an app uh, and and load in another one or you can say, well, I don't want to be a taxi. You know, I don't want to deal with driving people around. So I drive packages around, or I drive scooters around, mm -hmm. or there's all kinds of. Or I'm, you can be a handyman. You can be an economy gig. Economy now has you know there's housekeepers and lawn. It, it, it extends far beyond what we think it does. Mm -hmm. And they tried to solve the problem with Uber and Lyft, which there is. There's a couple genuine problems, like the the car rental thing's a mess. So there's a couple things they really could have generally focused on and actually fixed some real problems, but they didn't. They instead, they threw out the whole baby with the bathwater and essentially trying to destroy the, the livelihoods of tens of thousands of people. Well, and that's exactly what I was talking about. This is a sledgehammer, you know, to a, to a very, very fine problem. You know, it, you, you need a razor blade, not a hammer. So. Well, and speaking of sledgehammers, California also <laughs> recently <laughs> passed rent control. <laughs> so, and, and as... Uh, you know, that's something that economists have, have chimed, uh, you know, uh, for, for decades, if not centuries, that, that price controls are a terrible idea. And yet, you know, uh, uh, here we come diving in uh, headfirst on rent control in California. Uh, James, did you want to uh, dig in on that a little bit? Well, I'll, I'll let the city councilman spend, speak here some time <laughs> for it here in a second. But it, a lot of our politicians seem to have this phony belief that you can have high housing prices, high property values, and ever increasing property values, and low rents at the same time. And you can't. You literally can't have both. And we seem to have this notion that we can. Our politicians seem to think that you can focus on and prop up property values and then have low rents at the same time. And you literally can't do both. But uh, our city councilman here is, <laughs> is the guy who... <laughs> exactly. So. You know, the housing crisis has been a, an ongoing issue, especially, uh, you know, along that I-80 corridor where Dixon is. Um, and we were the last to get hit by it because, of course, Sacramento and San Francisco flowing towards each other. Um, but one of the things that I've been pushing for is uh, our, our zoning code is uh, Title 18. So we call it Title 18 Zoning Reform uh, and creating a, a website. So many cities have these arcane zoning codes that... Most city councilmen are completely unaware of the code that their city has. When that's their responsibility, 100%, first and foremost, you're a legislator, your product is the code, therefore you are responsible for it. And that's what I've been trying to inform my fellow councilmen about and throughout the county and throughout the state, is that uh, we have to take responsibility for that and then find a way as legislators to streamline those codes so that it's easier for local entrepreneurs and local investors 
to redevelop dilapidated lots, to uh, not pay, not be hammered with AB 1600 fees when they decide to take a, a <laughs> what may be four walls, right, and, and knock it down and turn it into a duplex or a triplex or, or something, or even condos that are really nice. You know, all of that needs to be streamlined instead of using the command and control method of rent control because we know it doesn't work. There's been scholarly study after scholarly study, and for some reason, they're still pushing this issue. Well, yeah, exactly, and it's price controls. And I mean price controls, whether you're setting a, uh, a floor on something, like maybe wages, or you're setting a ceiling on something like rents. Either way, you wind up with inefficiencies in the market when you try to tell people what they can and can't charge for either their services or goods. Or It's, it's been proven, as you say, time and again by economists. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, and another thing that uh, you brought up there that I, I couldn't help but notice is talked about how complex the codes were and you know it, at least in my experience the you know the, the the building codes are extraordinarily large I mean you look at uh, fire codes as part of the building code and I mean it's you know essentially hundreds if not thousands of pages just that particular code alone and to imagine that there's any one person who's making decisions who's aware of all of that information and the yeah. need for it all I, certainly I, I imagine most of that is well-intentioned and a lot of good people People have thought out a lot of these, uh, you know, safety codes uh, in order to protect people. But the idea that there's somebody who really has a handle on all of it seems a, a, almost like a fairy tale. <laughs> well, and you got to wonder how many of these codes is, you know, that's well intentioned and maybe even necessary. Like, you know, I don't want my building to fall down. I don't want my, the, I don't want the building I walk into to catch fire. So I don't mind, you know, the basic safety codes. Hey, we learned how to build a building properly. Here's how you do it. But have we gone through and taken out the old stuff that is no longer relevant? So when someone new can comes by and say, you're only looking at stuff that's actually relevant. You're not having to go back, oh, well, this code up here 50 pages later goes back and erases that code that's in there that has might have a line through it that we can't see because our photocopy is crappy. You know, it's, 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 you know I, I've, as a candidate for office, I know I, went, I read the, the book for um, the, the campaign finance rules. And it was just an unintelligible mess. You're going, what does any of this mean? And you go and you talk to two, you know, three different people, couple, you know, professional bureaucrats, and you get three different answers. And you're going, yeah. and and you, the same thing applies to building codes and and you know, remodeling your house or or putting a what a McDonald's down the street. They make the codes up. They change them depending upon what they actually want. Well, and essentially, the, the the more codes that you have, too, the more complicated and then expensive it makes to do anything. And, and so, it's not saying that these codes aren't necessarily uh, uh, necessary, but they they certainly are. You know, adding to costs and they add to complexity. Exactly. You know, just as a little anecdote and a project I was working on once, I was trying to figure out the population of gas cans that are out there throughout the state and I was going through the fire code and I saw within the fire code sure enough it said that uh, uh, all cans I think uh, storage above five gallons had to be permitted by the fire marshal which just sound like wow that seems strange and so I said but hot dog I've got a number here now I can go find out how many they permitted and so I went to the fire marshal's office and I said to them well so so where's the list of permits on this so I can count them up oh is that their show? Where, where is that? Oh, yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> but there it is in the codes. <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. in the codes. Somebody thinks we should do it, and at some point it may have been a good idea, but it's overly cumbersome to do, and yeah. no one, and yeah. the average citizen isn't going to do it. It's like licensing your cat. No one goes down and licenses their cat. You know, the four people who do it go license their cat. The rest of us, you just get the cat, and you know, you maybe you take it to the vet, and maybe the vet you get it licensed to the vet once or twice. Maybe, maybe not. But because we don't do it, it's a cat. You know, you yeah. love your cat, but you don't take it to get a license. You may get your dog license because your dog will bite somebody, and that's why you get your dog license. But you're not worried about your cat causing, you know, massive amounts of damage. Do exactly. You? Yeah. That story you were telling is perfectly endemic of of what happens at city halls <laughs> across California. Do tell. Um, so, but one of the most insidious things is that there is a. a, a a system in most cities for what's called a conditional use permit or a development agreement, right? And sometimes it requires both. But what that does is essentially bypass all the rules and says, okay, we the bureaucrats of the city are going to work with you to drop this agreement that's going to give us special tax revenue and 
we'll present it to the council, and the council will vote yay or nay on it, and that's it. You don't have to go through all these different rules and regulations. Hmm. Now, generally, you still have to follow state rules, but the the uh, zoning code and all of that. If it's if you're talking about something that's truly innovative, you're going to be hit up by a locality to get a special deal for them. Uh, you see it all the time now with cannabis, right? Because so many cities they didn't necessarily make cannabis ex- explicitly illegal or legal, but they said, well. Come to us, we'll talk, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out, right? That's not the way that the law is supposed to work. The law is supposed to be clear-cut, fair, equal to everyone. But we've gotten so far away from that, simply almost out of practicality, because we made the laws too complicated for anyone to be understanding and fair about it. Hmm. Yeah, so someone who can write a check or who has access <clears throat> to someone who has access to a bureaucrat or who can... He has the knowledge, you know, maybe you're a lawyer and you've been dealing with it for 20 years. They have far more access to the system than, say, a startup developer who wants to say, hey, there's an empty lot across the street in my ho- from my house. I want to buy it and put in, you know, a condo development. You know, you're 10 condos, you know, it's a perfect lot right there. And how do I get that done? That guy is screwed. He's going to have to go through all this complicated process. And while somebody else, you know, this big name developer, he can write a $10,000 check and says, yeah, here. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll just I'll just pay you guys extra taxes now instead of ten. It's going to be twelve condos. But well, you know, yeah. Well, <laughs> but you know, we we see this too with the tax code and everything else. It, it, things get so complex that the only people who can afford to understand it, uh, to any degree, to manipulate it, are those concentrated interests, the ones who can afford to hire the people to read through what an everyday person really doesn't have the time to do. But uh, anyways, uh, speaking of uh, other bad ideas, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Warren has said that if she gets uh, elected, that she is going to push something called the Accountable Capitalism Act. And so that essentially what she wanted, what she's getting at is that she thinks large corporations and they love making corporations the whipping boy of, of everything. But any corporation that's making essentially that's valued at over a billion dollars would be subject to requiring uh, to go to the government to get a permit in order to operate. And that permit requires certain, I guess, uh, what she considers social responsibility. James, did you want to jump in on that? Well. Man, I, I know we toss the word fascism around a lot these days, but from an absolutely technical aspect, you know, fascism is the attempt to control the culture and the economy through regulations. Well, this is fascism. You know, fascism doesn't require white nationalism. That came later. That was, you know, a sales t- technique, essentially. But actual fascism is the attempt to control the culture and the economy through regulations, and I can't understand. This is exactly what it is. Now you want to call it socialism, you want to call it democratic socialism, put whatever whatever you want on there, that whatever label you want on it, but essentially it's authoritarianism. You want the central committee, be it bureaucrats or an authoritarian, someone like Trump, wants to decide how the economy and the culture should develop. They want to control how it develops, engineer, engineer society to meet whatever end game they want. Yeah. And it, it really does get into the... I, I, I guess the, the the operation of how a company is supposed to uh, uh, form itself for leadership. I, uh, some of the specifics are she wants uh, the board, forty uh, percent of the board, to be elected by the labor, uh, you know, with uh, of the company. So, uh, and there's other prescriptions as well. I, I think they have to uh, show that they're accountable to their consumers. Well, I mean, the last I heard, that's how businesses succeed, is being <laughs> accountable to their consumers. Yes. But exactly. she thinks you need to prove this to a government agency that you're accountable to the consumers. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah your consumer, they bought my stuff. I mean, that's how, it's, they either buy my stuff or they don't buy my stuff. You know, it's, now you can argue maybe someplace like Google is not really being accountable to their consumers, but you know, I've stopped using Google. And I use YouTube in a way that I know costs them money. So, <laughs> so you know, you can, you can actually fight Google. You, as a consumer, I don't need the government to sit here and, and interfere in Google. I'm perfectly capable of, of handling that relationship between me and Google. I don't need Elizabeth Warren, who doesn't understand any of this stuff, Google and technology to begin with, sitting there trying to manufacture my relationship with them. I don't want no thank you. Right. Yeah. And the subjectivity of it all, it, it's... it's it's so strange to see what's always happened on the local level and been disturbing there, reaching up and happening on the federal level. You know, we're talking about a, a lot. We're going to make sure that you as a company are good enough 
you know, well, how do you how do you define that? How how are you going to make sure that that doesn't change time to time? And more importantly, if that's an innovative company and they're finding success in that innovation, why would they want to suddenly change their entire business model to be in line with what the federal government wants and what that particular federal government administration wants? Because you know that it's going to change from from administration to administration, you know. So I just I I don't understand why. We've seen this bad idea play out so many times on the local level where you have local councils and local legislatures deciding that, okay, well, we like these guys, we're gonna throw them a bone, but these guys, we don't like what they're up to. We've seen the picking winners and losers, and yet the federal government's trying to mirror what's going on at the local level. That's that's not a good thing at all, so. Well, in the end, too, I mean, I, I think it denies a basic realism of capitalism, and that's that, no one is really a slave to anyone in these things. I, you know, the 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 business is as much of a consu- uh, slave to the consumer as the consumer is to the business, and it's right. they're they're both mutually agreeing to engage with one another. And so, if we make choices to go away from them, that is the ultimate repudiation of the business. Uh, you know, and, and whether or not we think they're doing a good job. Um, but uh, speaking of uh, uh, other, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, bad things going on <laughs> in the uh, uh, national scene. Uh, e- Kavanaugh's back in the news, and it seems like it's a never-ending uh, a trial for whether or not he can stay a Supreme Court justice or be a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> Devin, did you want to talk on that a little bit? Well, I think it was just uh, Monday. Uh, um, uh, Kamala Harris was on on uh, PBS, and uh, you know she they asked her about Kavanaugh, and of course. Uh, immediately she launched into a predictable screed about you know impeachment investigation all of that uh, and even PBS was saying but there's really no evidence uh, backing up this New York Times story and I just find it hilarious that even PBS at this point is is calling out that this New York Times story has no backing and what I'm tired of seeing really is this cancel culture yeah. You know, and it's it started at college campuses. It probably has roots beyond that, but you know where it was noticeable to me was on college campuses, and then seeing it spread out to even the Congress is behaving in a way that engages in this cancel culture. Where well, speaking if we don't of like cancel it, culture, we're at about the end of our time. So thank you all for joining us for the Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, join us again next week, and you can catch us on Public Access 17 and uh, Google us on YouTube. Thank you.